So when I pass the microphone to you, you can, should I pass it? Should I, well, yeah, you, you, it'll be easier if you grab it, so I don't have to hold something. You don't want to hold it for me? Or can I hold it for you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Hi, John here with my friend Amanda Barker. Is it okay to, wait, I'll start over again. It's okay to say your last name when I have sure. to? Sure. Okay. Hello, John here with my friend Amanda Barker. Hi, Amanda. Hi. We're both vegans and animal rights activists, and we have something else in common about being minimalist, and uh, I'm trying to live on not much money, but you're even going farther with that and living without money. Yes, I'm just sharing with you, so you're helping me live without money, yes. <laughs> I, I heard a, a, a quote a while back, money has replaced community for our security. And so that's something that help is helping us to live off not much money or live without money is having a strong community. You know, being a part of the animal rights community is really wonderful. We've met so many f fantastic people who are, who are happy to share. Yeah, exactly. I find other activists are open to sharing because it's for the same cause. So if they share a ride with me or let me couch surf, they know that that helps us to have more time to go to the events, to go to the vigils. So it's a, a great way to be a freegan or be a minimalist as part of this community, yeah. Also, you've done hitchhiking. Yes. That's something I've never done, but I, I hope to experience that with you sometime. And I know some people are afraid of hitchhiking, but you say you haven't had any any terrifying experiences. Yeah. No, not terrifying, but it wasn't terrifying for me that someone accidentally thought I was a prostitute. So I reflected uh, maybe I wasn't dressed uh, the best, but I was dressed normally with a giant hitchhiking backpack. Um, but it was just a miscommunication um, the last two years. Only, only, only positive. So I have nothing to share with others that I would say be scared. Yeah, and you said you've gotten gotten into vehicles with people, and sometimes they're just you know lonely and they want someone to talk with. And you said you've gone for long rides with someone where you didn't even say anything; you just listened to them do the talking. That's very true. I did not get to say two words. They did not want to ask me a question. They wanted someone. I've been with people where they just got fired. I've been with people who have children that just passed away from a heroin addiction. And they really, I think, were comforted to have someone just to listen to them. Do you have any tips for people who want to try hitchhiking? Great question, John. Uh, I do have. Um, I've just, I've mostly done it as a, a lone woman. Uh, I have done it with friends, with other women, with men. Um, I would say definitely be approachable. I don't know if that works. I met guys who do it alone and they will juggle. They will um, be holding a funny sign. Uh, I definitely think to talk for a few moments before you get in a vehicle. Uh, make sure that they are going the same direction, that you don't have the mis miscommunication, that you are a prostitute. So uh, these things and definitely... I would just say it can happen very naturally. So it doesn't mean that you have to be standing there with your thumb. Uh, if you're at a gas station, I sometimes just sit and drink until even I naturally start a conversation with somebody. Uh, they might say something like, where are you going? You have your backpack or you look like Waldo's sister with that hat on or, and then it uh, happens very organically. And these are sometimes very, very nice as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I just want to say, by the way, as far as minimalism goes, we're sitting on the floor. Hey, why sit in a chair when you can sit on the floor? And I visited people who don't even have any living room furniture. They just have a big open floor, and it's like a vegan flop house where you can come crash on the floor. And y you and I, we're not is into collecting stuff. We'd rather collect memories by traveling around and having adventures. And I I'd love for you to share one of my favorite stories that I've heard from you yet about being in Detroit and uh, giving a gentleman uh, a shoulder massage. I think that's a beautiful story. Can you share that story? Yeah, I would love to, of course. Um, I was hitchhiking to North Carolina uh, for an event at one of the largest pig slaughterhouses in the world, and I got stuck in downtown Detroit at night. Uh, I was also doing with no money, so I was very curious what was going to happen to me, and uh, I ended up sleeping on someone's couch who I just met, some... A uh, kind gentleman that was homeless until a week ago himself. And then I, when I was leaving the next day with my backpack, this gentleman approached me and asked me if I was homeless. And I said, uh, what do you mean by homeless? And he said, good point, okay. 
So we started walking together and it appeared that he had just been released from prison after 18 years of being in prison, uh, going in when he was 18 years old for possession of drugs and weapons. He had never hurt someone. He was a very humble, very kind, gentle soul, was also camping. Uh, they don't give you something when you leave prison in America these days, no support. Uh, and we were sitting in the park. Uh, it was a beautiful day with the sun shining. And after talking and yeah, picking his brain about being in prison, which maybe was not the optimal thing to do, um, just for his sake of wanting to forget about it, uh, I just offered if he would like a shoulder rub. And so he took off his shirt. We were in the park. And I gave him a back rub and a, a shoulder massage. And I can just see the tears running down his face. Um, it was a gift for me to be able to do that for him. Uh, I'm sure that in 18 years in prison, uh, you don't get very much contact with uh, other people, let alone a woman. I know there weren't women in the prison except for security guards. I don't know if that matters, but just the touch, the contact, and uh, to do something that made him feel uh, loved was a gift for me. So, yeah, it was a very beautiful experience. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that beautiful story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've talked about, uh, as far as not spending money, how to get around. You've done hitchhiking. And uh, what about eating? Ha have you ever, I, I tried dumpster diving with a friend once, and I joined that. She actually went into the dumpster, and she passed the food out to me. So I, I, I helped in that way. But you've done quite a bit of dumpster diving. Uh, yeah, I love dumpster diving. I think our friend the other day said that, yeah, in the ideal future, it won't be necessary. But... Uh, hopefully dumpster diving will get us to that point where food is not wasted the way it is. In Europe, it's much easier. The dumpsters are smaller. They're not locked. They're not attached. They're written on them, food for the people. In Canada, they're giant. They're locked. They're compressed. Unfortunately, you can still see how much copious amounts of edible food are thrown away. Uh, so I more so resorted to community meals where the food is donated from the stores, even though they have a lot more to give. And I will give my time to talking with the organizers of the community meals to have more of this food donated, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just find food uh, during the course of your day around outside somewhere, yeah. uh, like f foraging or I, I remember like in... in Back home in Niagara Falls, I'd be walking down the street and I'd see a bunch of berries on the ground. Oh, it's a mulberry tree, and I would I would pick from the mulberry tree. So you've you found a lot of food that way too, just out in nature. Yeah, I don't plan ahead how I'm going to get food. So if I, for example, was just in Athens, Georgia, couch surfing, and I would go for a walk, pecan trees everywhere. So unfortunately, I missed the peach season, but pecans everywhere. I s there was some gardens that had kale growing in it that you could just take. So I was living days off kale and pecans and rosemary for tea. And yeah, it's so nice. And and you've done a lot of couch surfing like I have. It's been over three years now where I haven't paid rent anywhere. I've just been traveling around and couch surfing. And when I'm uh, home base is still the Niagara region, Toronto area for me. And I have siblings who have let me uh, stay with them. And I try to help out. And but I know sometimes I still feel like a mooch once in a while. And you said you've experienced that too a little bit. Maybe maybe feeling like a mooch. How how do you deal with that? I'd say I feel the perception from others that they think we're mooches. And I don't want them to feel that way. It's, I think, a condition of the way that we are grown up in the community. Uh, they, don't want, they don't think so much about the waste, the overproduction. They want everyone to participate in the community, even if we have an overabundance and it's not being shared and there's people's needs not being met that don't have money to uh, have those needs met in that system. So... Uh, yeah, I think some people think, okay, yeah, great, you're a freegan, but you're using my money. You're using my couch, you're using my food, you're using my car. Uh, I would hope that they would be open to consider it as sharing, that when I was using money, I would share, and they have these things, and they will share, and um, it is maybe better for the community if we share a home or share meals together, even if we are using money to use less money by making dal with rice which is a one dollar dinner we can share with many people in india when they make dinner for a hundred people it doesn't cost them very much money i mean it's coming from the field it, we both know it, 
it, money is not real. They're not really using money at all. But yeah, um, I would hope that they would be open to me giving in a different way rather than something using money and that they would be sharing. And as far as not feeling like a mooch, there are many ways of contributing that don't involve money. For instance, when I'm at home, I have nieces and nephews and I... Uh, and I, I haven't bought them a present for their birthday or Christmas or anything like that in many, many years. But we uh, have lots of fun in many other ways, playing board games together, drawing pictures. And they love it when I, when I pretend I'm like a monster and I chase them around the couch and all of that sort of thing. And so, yeah, and when I'm traveling around with people, I try to help out around the house. And I, uh, I, I've had lots of fun making videos with people, music videos, and they really enjoy that. So... And and a lot of people just want someone to talk to, like the people that you're hitchhiking, uh, the ones who are picking you up. So a lot of people, they seem to, it seems to be win-win to me that they're having fun talking with me and, and likewise. So. Yeah, and sometimes I like to say to people, um, would you rather someone sit under a fruit tree and look at the fruit tree and do nothing or be successful and productive and tear apart the mountain to, co to coal mine, for example, and destroy the nature? Some, why do we feel like we need to do something or why do I need to do something for you to be valuable? Why is my value attached to what I do for somebody? And I, it's not part of something that we come in contact with. We're always thinking about what to do, give, think, calculate. So I also agree, if you're living like us, you have to be good company. You're not going to be taken into someone's home if you're not good company. And I think we were talking yesterday about money as a type of security that people use. Uh, they know that they will be in the nursing home if they have money. They know that when they're sick, they'll be taken care of if they have money. Well, uh, we would also we would have to work on being connected with people and having people have concern for us if we can't pay them or if we don't pay them. And so it's a totally different way of... Uh, understanding our connection whether we're using money or not we're highly connected highly dependent people would say okay you just depend on others true we also do when we have money yeah. same thing yeah and i uh, i read somewhere that uh, if they had to pay for the amounts of environmental destruction they're causing virtually no industries would be profitable so yeah we're, we're conditioned to work 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 and consume 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 but I feel better about not working at a pointless, destructive job. And, you know, we, we do, we make the world a better place in other ways through our activism and things like that and, and sharing. Mm -hmm. As you said, helping people paint their homes, helping people move, uh, teaching yoga for free, helping someone learn guitar for free. These are just activities and we label them as jobs and they can build a home can also just be an activity that we do with passion. And we both see money as being an, an illusion, that real wealth is your health and nature and relationships and collecting memories. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, besides couch surfing, I, you've also, you have a tent. And so I, this past summer, I did something, I heard it referred to as being stealth camping, mm -hmm. where my friend and I went for a long bike ride, and we didn't pay for a campground. We just found a, an area out in the woods, and we set up our tents there. And uh, but you've done you've done quite a bit of that uh, camping where you're not at a campground. You just got find a free place to stay, where you know secluded place where you're safe. And and have you ever had anyone like police or anyone bother you in the middle of the night while you're trying to sleep? Or? No. And I met someone who was biking from Belgium to uh, Iran, and he would camp every night. And he says, um, "Yeah, nobody's going to come into your tent. What would you do? You wouldn't go into somebody's tent that you see there." Um, obviously, in the middle of a city, it might be different, but if you're outside the city, then... And most people are not against if you camp near them. Sometimes if you knock on their door to ask if you can camp in their backyard, they will just say, come sleep inside or come have dinner with us and then go camp there. Um, same thing again about, yeah, connecting with the people and yeah. using your connection and positive interaction to share. But yeah, camping is uh, quite a concept. Of course, we both don't believe in private property, that nobody owns something. Um, so camping anywhere along, if you, if I wouldn't hitchhike after it gets dark, uh, avoid that maybe. And then well, before it gets dark, finding somewhere that you can put your tent. I have to say I'm the worst, I don't care. I will just 
put it up, it's falling down, and uh, I don't really care. So um, if we go together hitchhiking down to BC, then it, this will be nice. Maybe you are better at this than me because I um, I have no camp. I don't even bring a flashlight or any of these camping things. Just just some cover in case it's raining. So. Yeah. Well, I know a backpack can be heavy after a while. So exactly. It's nice if you don't carry stuff that you don't really need mm -hmm. to make your load load lighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. There's always more to learn, and we should question everything. And for instance, yesterday I was making a smoothie, and I cut up some ginger, and I thought I was doing a good thing. We're making a smoothie. The ginger in the smoothie will make it taste especially delicious. But then you said to me, the peels for the ginger, you're not just going to compost them, are you, John? And I, I was. <laughs> and then uh, you kind of made me feel like a monster a little bit. What kind of person would just compost the peels? So, But you can use... You should really think about everything and what can you use that for? And obviously that you could m use it for soup or like tea or something like that. Yeah, that's the thing. I wish when more people had more free time, a lot of these things take time. Uh, you can make vegetable broth with all your peelings, with all your carrot tops, even though you can eat your carrot tops, all these things. Um, as I guess I understand if you're not buying organic, you might be worried Um but yeah, all these things that take time. Also, the making the shampoo with the ash, using ash to clean everything. Uh, another free way to do things: just clean everything with ash, lemon, vinegar, uh, baking soda. Yeah, it's so simple, but we're not taught these things, so yeah, yeah we don't know. Yeah. And yesterday, I ate an apple, and we were gonna go for a walk, and then you said we started walking, and you said, "Oh, we forgot the apple seeds." So yeah, the apple that I just finished eating, we I came back to the house, got the seeds, and then we planted them in the woods somewhere, and so maybe an apple tree will grow. Yeah, gorilla planting, it's such a great phenomena. I love people who go hiking that bring their seeds and their compost. Uh, I think this is the natural way that uh, we have put so much time and effort into gardening. I've heard some people talk about gardening being the first uh, gateway into control, that we tried to control the land, and this led to other forms of control, that in nature it really is a good balance. We look around Canada, we don't see so many things growing, uh, but there are a lot more than what we're used to eating, the maple leaves, the mustard, the hedge mustard, the mustard garlic, these things growing all around us that we're just not aware of. It makes me sad to see the big waste of land, like with people having huge front lawns. And you think of what that l land could be used for, uh, you know, community gardens and uh, campgrounds for travelers, you know, set up your tent on someone's front lawn and things like that. Yeah, lawns and all of the food grown to feed uh, animals that are used in animal agriculture. From London to Toronto, you only see fields of corn for animals. And I had a friend once, um, in the discussion about eating animals say that we can't grow food for humans in this area where we're growing food for animals and I have done my research since then and it's not true I mean Saskatchewan is the lentil producer for the world 85% of the world's lentils um, we can be growing uh, human food there or animal food we're all animals but um, food forests in Belgium where we're combining everything working away from this monoculture and uh yeah, the possibilities are yeah. so, so endless. Okay, because we don't have, uh, I don't have much money, and you've been working with no money, you don't even have a bank account right now, you're saying? Uh, no, uh, so I'm lucky to have very good friends. My friend Veronique uh, supported me a couple years ago when I started to switch. I said, okay, can I just put some money in your account and I'll close mine? And then uh, I had one in Canada, and when I came back, I wasn't using it, and they had started to charge me a, a small fee, so okay, I closed that one too. Uh, so I don't use, and I wanted to go to the food bank the other day to check out just to see what it's like. Also, expired food, going to the food bank, uh, see how the system works, and so <laughs> I go up to talk to her, and that was not possible that I didn't have a bank account. So to say to her, uh, she said, proof of your bank information. I said, but I, yeah, I don't have a bank account. It was not possible for her. She she just kept saying, well, okay, next time try to bring your, your income or some proof of the... Uh, so uh, I haven't thus far needed one. I stopped using the money in July now. Uh, I haven't needed one since. Of course, I'm doing things a certain way now. I don't know what will happen in the future, but for now... Same as the both, we don't have a cell phone. Yeah. Uh, so far, it's 
quite okay and quite nice, yeah. qu quite stress free to not think about this. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful for that. Yeah. You've been practicing, and I try too, you've been learning about nonviolent communication. Mm -hmm. And so, as activists, you know, sometimes some activists are maybe a little nasty with their words, and I, I'm guilty of that too. But you try to be very loving with your language and practice nonviolent communication, and I admire that. Thank you, John. Yeah, I think people have a perception of what nonviolent communication means. It's something very specific in the framework that Marshall Rosenberg outlines, and it's about evaluations and judgments, not so much necessarily about, yeah, calling someone a murderer. This is an evaluation and a judgment, but it's about identifying the needs and feelings in the others around you. So I would look at you and what you've done today or yesterday and think, okay, yeah, maybe he has a need for hugs or he has a need for understanding or he has a need to be respected w in respect to this and then how their feelings are connected to that. So it's basically about showing empathy. It's very hard for us to think about what somebody else's needs are. Asking them is a good start, but yeah, I want to work more with this nonviolent communication theory uh, for outreach mm, to help try to have more meaningful discussions with people about eating animals and using them. Yeah, I, I love that. I Taking the time to think about someone other than yourself and ide identifying someone's needs. For instance, when you met that guy and you you thought maybe he'd like a shoulder rub and he, he liked it so much he cried. Mm -hmm. And yesterday you and I were watching a movie together and I was sitting on the couch and in the corner and you looked a little tired and I thought maybe you'd be more comfortable in the corner. So we switched spots and then you fell asleep. Yeah. You read my mind perfectly. <laughs> I have to be careful what I think because you are definitely a mind reader, yes. <laughs> so, and as far as needs go, we know that we don't need to eat anything from animals. We can get all, all our nutrition from, from plant foods. And so wh what inspired you to go vegan? Like, have you been vegan for a long time? Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, as of most other vegans that I know, our one regret is not being vegan sooner. I feel quite ashamed of myself that I didn't know this information earlier. It's so obvious to me now that, yeah, I was hurting them completely unnecessarily. Um, so it was my friend Veronique who brought the idea, and then just the lucky, lucky chance that I saw that Gary Yurovsky speech, um, the best speech ever. And uh, it's just so interesting to me that if I had not seen that one-hour talk I today might still be eating animals. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about the, his points of view. I hadn't thought about the animal's point of view. And it makes you reassess everything else that you're doing because how is this not possible? How is it possible that I didn't think like that? Yeah. Yeah. And besides being vegan, it's important to, to do some activism. And uh, so you've gone to bear witness. Uh, with the SAFE movement, sometimes we go to a uh, factory farm where the trucks are banging to the animals to get killed. Uh, we went up to the truck where uh, the pigs were, and you were even singing to the pigs. I thought that was lovely, singing to the pigs. Yes, I also feel a bit guilty. I do think that I have a moral obligation to even stop the trucks further. I think of Jewish children going into a concentration camp where I know that they are going to be gassed, and I feel that I would have had a moral obligation to stop that truck. If you know that it's about to happen, you should be stopping it. When does my moral obligation end to stop the violence? You know, if I see someone beating a dog on the street, I'm going to stop them. I should be stopping 20 pigs going into their death unnecessarily. Um, so this is something I feel con yeah, conflicted about quite often. Well, I like you being al alive, and we do have to be careful. We don't want you to get run over or anything, because some of these truck drivers, they just do not want to slow down even. I like you being alive, too. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're planning on attending the Animal Liberation Conference in Berkeley, California in May? Yes, I am, as long as the U.S. lets me in. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how are you planning to get uh, to California, all the way from uh, southern Ontario? Uh, sort of the brainstorming now is to leave uh, from London, Ontario, going up to BC, hitchhiking, maybe bike or camp a bit along the way, and then go down this way through Portland, uh, down to California. I want to have an open invitation for people if they'd like to come a part of it with me, hitchhiking, camping, if someone is open to hosting me uh, and a friend along the way, uh, the more the merrier always. 
and it's definitely a great introduction to freeganism if you're open to it and uh yeah hitchhiking together is just such a nice activity i will leave around yeah april 15th slowly slowly as everything that i do and uh it will be really fun and very adventurous and if someone would like to join they'd have to be open for dumpster diving eating from the forest um biking trips and yeah walking long distances maybe getting wet maybe being stinky um but definitely fun and we will bring some music and guitar and and just chill very good so if if someone wants to contact you <laughs> can we include that in the video like your your can i put your email address on or do you have email i have email okay mm -hmm. so can we include that in the video yes john yes <laughs> Okay, okay, excellent. So if you want to join Amanda on a big adventure, and and I I may do that. I'm still I'm still thinking about. It. I've never tried hitchhiking before, but I'm I'm open to it. And I find when you're with someone who's very brave, like y four years ago, I was with a friend, and she wanted to take me sneaking into factory farms mm -hmm. to liberate some animals, and I was nervous because I'd never done that before. And we went to a farmhouse, and the lights were on, and people were home. And I was nervous, okay, like I'd, I'd never trespa trespassed before, but I did it because she was so confident. And so if I were to hitchhike with someone, I feel that you're so confident about it that you'd be a good person to do that with. Okay, so any any final remarks? Uh, just grateful to you that you exist and that you do this with me. I don't know anything about technology, so I think it's important information. I hope other people feel supported and open to trying uh, some of the things that we've talked about and to reach out to us if we can support them in any way to meet their needs. <laughs> Very nice. Can I give you a hug? Yeah, of course. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Peace. Yeah. Go vegan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So after we did our interview today with John, we went to the store to get some materials for hummus. And when they went into the grocery store, I went over to the um, Rexall, the type of pharmacy, just to check it out. And yeah, we found all this. So it had just been Valentine's Day. All of the lovely heart-filled cards were thrown into the garbage. We've counted over 250 cards. And there's some super nice ones here. We separated them for mom, for husband, for wife, in case they want to use. They have some really nice ones here that you can even keep after Valentine's Day. Some of them that sing to us. Cool, but we would never like personally buy any cards like this. It's just the fact that they're, you know, it's better. I, 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 we agreed to on, uh, for Valentine's Day or, or any other day to give someone a heartfelt message written on a scrap of paper mm -hmm. or like make your own card. But we thought that that's, uh, you know, rather than have them just go to a landfill, we could rescue them and, and they could help bring some joy to some people. Except for this card. Except for this card. This one has them eating an animal, so oh, we definitely no. wouldn't want to give someone to that on a day celebrating love. So we decided we would rip up this one. We also had a couple other ones that were um, water damaged, so we got rid of those. And another unfortunate thing is most of these are made in China. Yeah. So we really think it's quite unfortunate that this was one sto small store, the cards they threw out from Valentine's Day. So we did up the math and yeah, the cards are worth over $2,000. The food is worth over $100. And Ma this was just from one day. Yeah, many bags of uh, crackers here. And the boxes were a little damp, so we recycled them. And all of these bars here and some vitamins and peanuts. And there are some bars that you found, uh, some other food, uh, Amanda, that wasn't vegan, so we didn't take that because, of course, we're vegans. But yeah, we got lots of delicious vegan treats here and some cards to give to friends. So uh, good haul. Well, you inspired me to do mm -hmm. more dumpster diving. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, John. <laughs>